Hello everyone, and welcome to Straight Chilling. Each week we watch and review a horror film for your entertainment. You can send all questions and comments to straightchillingpodcast at gmail.com. And don't forget to keep chilling. Shall we straight chilling? Serial killing? Five cold fillers on the line, got you reeling. Five star ratings from the floor to the ceiling. If you catch a one star, no time for feelings. Got a demon DJ on the ones and twos. By the name El Sabato, don't get confused. So grab a seat by the fire, roast them all over two. And prepare to hear the legend of the straight chilling crew. What up, nerds? Welcome to another thirsty episode of Straight Chilling, the weekly horror movie review show where you chill and we kill, butcher, maim, and otherwise dissect yet another horror movie. My name is Bob, and I'll be your host for the evening. This is episode number 265, recorded on Tuesday, May 5th, 2020, also known as Jinko DeMaio. Tonight, we're going to be discussing a movie called Thirst from 2009. Uh, before we get into it, let me introduce everyone else on the show tonight. First up, calling in from Astoria, Oregon, we got our boy Randy Gandy. G. Landy, what's up, man? What's up? I'm, I didn't wear my Jinkos today. I, you know, <laughs> I had to cover my pool. So, <laughs> <laughs> Jinkos are not cool in Oregon. You can get away with them in Florida still because Florida's a little bit. Any really? I don't, I don't know. <laughs> no, I don't think I so. By getting away with it, do you mean you won't be arrested? Because I, I think that that's a pretty low bar. It's already <laughs> hot in Florida. Like you're wearing uh, swim shorts or nothing at all. That's really all you can get away with. Well, that's those are the only things you need to wear. Ain't that the truth? Last but not least, calling in from Southern Korea, we got our boy Soju. What's up, man? Hello, it is me, Soju. Yo, Jinko Joao. There's something different about you, Jesus. I understood Jinko. Yeah, yeah. I understood that. Ha- you- Happy Jinko to Mayo, boys. That's a that's <laughs> that's a fashion trend from your era, huh? Can you tell us a little bit more about the? It's Jinko the one that most jean trend. That's uh-huh. that's a trend that really stood the test of time. Yeah. Can you yeah. tell us about the puka shell necklace trend from your era? <laughs> Justin? Yeah. Oh, Justin, I have some bad news. J Crew bank- went bankrupt this week. So. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> Not the crew. <laughs> Not the crew. Not my boy crew. <laughs> Did you guys see that um that picture I posted with Adam Sandler from like the nineties? He had the puka picture of you with rocking. Adam Sandler? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's from a movie though. It's from Airheads. Is it? Yeah. He's oh, not just Airheads, man. Yeah, it's Airheads. Dude. Um, that movie's ridiculous. It is. So, dude, this this movie was chosen as by Justin, so yes. aka Soju, which we haven't chosen movies outright for quite some time. Um, uh, but due to the coronavirus, a lot of the new releases have been pushed back. So instead of covering new releases, we are gonna pick some movies for the first time in a long time. Juice, do you know how long it's been since you chose a movie outright for us to review? Ooh, that's a good I remember when we stopped picking movies, my pick was next. <laughs> I was a little salty <laughs> oh, about that. Been, for a while. Yeah, been salty. I think uh, low burn and flame for a while. It's, huh? it's been close to two years, I believe, since we stopped picking <laughs> yeah. movies. The last had a hold of the grudge. The last movie <laughs> you chose for us to review was Train to Busan. So there's a bit of a theme. Oh, here. oh wow! Nice. Okay, uh, which we released the episode on June 1st of 2018, and that was Just episode 164. It's been a hundred really episodes. Pushing wow. agi- an agenda with us, huh, Juice? <laughs> <laughs> Pushing the globalization train. We get it. Mm. You live in Korea, okay? Everybody knows. Mm-hmm. 101 episodes, and finally you get to pick a movie outright. Finally. Thirst it is. So thirsty. And Ghost was already gone, so. I know. It would have been Ghost had we not previously covered it. I believe that. Uh, before we get to the review, let's tackle some housekeeping real quick. Um, so the uh, the winner of the May poll pick, um, I can now officially announce it. Um, it's going <sighs> to be it, Bob. Tucker and Dale. Look. <laughs> Tucker and Dale versus Evil. No, Tucker. not yet. <laughs> <laughs> huh? what? Tucker and Dale. So they led the way the whole time. Yeah, they yeah. did. Okay. Yeah. Um, and it, it finally won our, our horror comedy theme uh, for May. Uh, so that means that the June cold <gasps> pick is now posted over on our Patreon website. So if you support mm. us on Patreon at the $5 level or above, you get the chance to vote on a movie we're going to be talking about this June. Uh, the theme for June is going to be Dastardly Ditties or Dads because, you know, it's Father's Day. And, uh, <laughs> 
Yeah. Let's talk about some <laughs> fucked up dads in horror movies. We have to clarify our own goddamn <laughs> yes, rhetoric so much. Uh, the three movies you can vote between are Eraserhead, Rosemary's Baby, and The Woman. Bob? Justin. How are those numbers looking so far? Eraserhead is currently besting the woman Ooh. by just by just a couple votes and rosemary's baby uh, just a couple back, huh I'm, sh- I'm sure it'll get overtaken eventually Man. bob don't worry i'm I, sure you won't have to watch it heavens head. everything's fine so can't <laughs> stand <laughs> eraser head can't, yes, can't good. Stand oh, that movie. you just submit to the fact that don't, that's the movie we're going to be covering don't worry <laughs> bob in heaven everything is fine you're right okay oh david lynch um also <laughs> also in uh patreon news we have uh one new brand new patreon supporter we got to give mad shouts out to uh big thank you for signing up on patreon jacqueline r uh we much appreciate it um, thank you so much jacqueline mm-hmm. and uh, as is tradition around these parts we owe you the straight chilling salute this one is for jacqueline here we go Slap my ass! Slap my ass, Jack. <laughs> Slap somebody's ass. <laughs> okay. Now now we're all in trouble. Now it's very personal. <laughs> um, <laughs> anyways, uh, over on the uh, the Patreon website as well, if you support us at the $10 level, we have a whole slew of uh, bonus episodes that are exclusive to Patreon. I posted a couple uh, last week. I did a mini cast on porno. Uh, which is the new movie that was produced by Fangoria. <laughs> and um, I also did one on a movie called Extraordinary, uh, which is a Will Forte um, comedy, like supernatural comedy. It's actually like an Irish production, uh, which is kind of interesting. Uh-huh. Super funny. Um, so if you're interested in my thoughts on those movies, those are over on our Patreon website as well. God we damn. currently have 17 bonus episodes on our Patreon. Good. 17. And those will that. never, never go away. Uh, nope. That's true. Um, yeah, and so I, I've been slacking a little bit. I need to get on that. Um, I'll be contributing uh, a couple more episodes this month as well. So, good. Covering I might some contribute more an series. episode one day. <laughs> one day, Randy <laughs> one might day. contribute Maybe. here. <laughs> one day. <laughs> Red Stag Randy will record an episode. And I was told that I carry this podcast by one of our illustrious listeners. <laughs> 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 My head's a little big at the moment. Proof Everyone's the got their favorite, you know? I can't. Yeah, and it's hashtag me. Hashtag hard with Randy. And it's that, me. <laughs> that listener was hashtag hard with Randy. Juice, uh, are we all? you've got some housekeeping. <laughs> What's going on with you, man? Yeah, actually, just the way the kind of timing worked out with uh, the days, we have two new videos up on our YouTube since the last our last episode aired. Um, so Resident Evil 3, the remake, now has a review up on YouTube. That's the game I played um, in April on our Twitch channel. If you like horror video games, if you're interested in maybe checking out Resident Evil, I do have a full review up now on our YouTube page. And also, I it is Top 5 Tuesday. Actually, today. Today is Tuesday. Wow, nice. Top 5 Tuesday. It's the first Tuesday of the month I've been doing Top 5 list. Um, if you couldn't have guessed it from my month-long What You've Been Watching, I covered my Top 5 Horror Anthologies. I wanted to do my proper research and um, try to cover some ones, like older ones and stuff I, I hadn't watched before. So I got... In a decent amount. There were still some I didn't get to. Like, I've never seen Black Sabbath still. Oh, um, really? I wanted to get to it, but I just I didn't have quite the time. But um, there is a new a Top 5 Tuesday, Top 5 Horror Anthology Films. Um, you can check that out on YouTube.com forward slash Straight Chillin' Podcast. Don't forget to, Randy, hit that like and... Are you queuing me up? Oh, I don't, I don't, am, I'm dude. Doing you doing so performing well. monkey, baby. All right. Miss, Mr. Wrestling Randy over here. Uh, Slash that mail. <laughs> the wind up. That was pretty good. Yeah. Yeah. Like you it. know, I, 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 I channeled Richard Nixon on that one. <laughs> <laughs> good. So, yeah. Um, and that is uh, my house. So, I believe yeah, this man. house has been kept. I got a couple more things real quick, actually. Oh, no. Nope. We, we got a lot. <laughs> 
Uh, um, you start talking first. I assume you just cover your bases. Uh, I'm going to sandwich you. I'm going to sandwich you, my dog. Yeah. Uh, mm. So our sister podcast, Let's Get Physical Media, just released episode number seven. Um, if you're unfamiliar, Let's Get Physical Media talks about Blu-rays and 4Ks and the boutique Blu-ray distributors uh, that help keep physical media alive. Uh, of course, we focus on horror movie media, uh, but we touch on some other things as well. Um, you can get that anywhere you get your podcast. We talk about movies that we picked up in the months of March and April of 2020. Um, also, big thanks to everybody that joined us for our Joe Bob live watch party last Friday. This is uh, something that we host over on Zoom, and uh, we intend to do so for the entirety of uh, Joe Bob's The Last Drive-In Season 2, which we've got eight more Fridays uh, worth of Season 2. So if you want to join us, um, we post a link to join our Zoom watch party uh, just before 9 o'clock Eastern Standard Time every Friday. Um, If you don't have a Zoom account, it's free to sign up. Um, All you got to do is click on the link once we blast it out just before showtime on Friday, and you'll join in our uh, live watch party. It's been a lot of fun the past couple weeks, and uh, something I always look forward to. For those of us who stayed awake. (coughs) Right, yeah, which was not me. (laughs) I do what I can, man. (laughs) I do what I can. Um, So, yeah. Keep your eyes and ears open for that coming up this Friday. The drive-in will never die. Uh, That's it. That's all we got. This house has been kept. Let's go ahead and uh, jump into the main event. Um, Also, if you are part of the uh, hashtag hard with us crew, you've been listening to us for a while. um, This is obviously the point of the show where we typically tackle what we've been watching. Uh, We're going to move that to the end of the show just to make sure that we get to the the main feature a little bit quicker. Um, But we're still going to do it. So... Hang on. You're still going to get to hear us talk some <laughs> bullshit. Stick around. Stick around for the social hour afterwards. That's, We're going to have finger what, foods. That's what it's going to be. And uh, heavy cocktails. Some pigs in a blanket. A heavy finger cocktails. food segment of the show. Yes. Uh, <laughs> little triangle sammies. Little triangle tuna fish I brought sammies. mini caches. A real meet and greet, you know. <laughs> I got him at Costco. Oh, man. I love the mini quiche. Anyway, let's go ahead and uh, <laughs> get in the main event. We're talking about Thirst from 2009 and kicking it off with the back of the box. What's on the back of the box? Uh, right. Um, <laughs> what's on the back of the box? I don't dude. have a box, Rob. You're the hang physical on. media guy. How hang we doing? This, hang on. Bob, I... Nope. <laughs> I thought I might have something. <laughs> you... Nope. Uh, Thirst from 2009. Uh, this was directed by... Uh, Chan Chan Wook Park, which is actually credited as Park Chan Wook, which I have recently been told the W and Wook, you don't pronounce it. It's Ook, right, Juice? Yeah, is par- par- yeah Park Chan Wook. Park Chan Wook is how you would actually say that. Thank you, sir. Uh, this is starring a bunch of other people whose names I'm going to not butcher real quick. Uh, the plot synopsis <laughs> is as follows. Uh, through a failed medical experiment, a priest is stricken with vampirism and is forced to abandon his acidic ways. Uh, gentlemen, had you guys seen this movie before? Would you recommend people check it out? Randy? Uh, this was a first for me. Um, I had seen, I had just seen it around mentioned here or there, but I hadn't, I really didn't have much of an idea. I didn't even realize there was a lot of vampirism going on in this movie or what the general premise was. So yeah, it was pretty new for me and yeah, I would recommend it. I think it's, uh, it's worth your time, especially if you're, you know, if you're down for something from, uh, not the state side or somewhere, somewhere abroad. Um, just been interested recently in, in looking into, um, into releases from other parts of the, other parts of the world, excuse me. And this is definitely like pretty, pretty on par with, uh, some of the better American films and some of the better Korean films as well in the horror genre. So I would say it's worth it. Cool. Juice. What about you? Yeah, I had seen this before. I really like this director. He also did um, Old Boy. He did Snowpiercer. And he did one I haven't seen yet. It's really high on my list. It's really highly regarded. It's called... um, Oh, God. I already forgot it. The the Handmaiden. The Handmaiden. Um, But he's a really good director. He also did one of the segments in Three Extremes, which is one of the anthologies I talked about a week or two ago. Um, So he's a highly regarded... Um, Korean director and um, I saw this film and I was really mesmerized by it and I really wanted to talk with uh, someone about it and I didn't really have anybody to talk to about since then I have talked to one Korean friend about it 
Um, and she had some interesting perspectives, but I am really excited to talk about it with you guys. Well, nobody um, will bring perspective like three white men. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I just like want to talk about Jesus. the intricacies like of the story. It's yeah. um, it's really interesting. So, but I would recommend. I would recommend you check it out. I think it's a really cool twist on a vampire tale. Yes, I'd seen this movie a handful of times before. Um, Kino Lorber put a, a Blu-ray of this out, uh, I think last fall. Um, so it's a, it's but previous to that. It was only on DVD. I recommend you pick it up. Um, yeah, I highly recommend watching this. I love, uh, a bizarre twist on a vampire tale or like a, a wonky vampire story. That's not just like Dracula in a castle. Um, and this definitely satiates that, uh, highly recommend you check it out. Uh, let's go ahead and drop that spoiler warning and we'll get into the rest of the review. Here we go. Spoiler warning. Yes. You've been warned. <laughs> You've been warned. I think we, um, we, at one point we had a poll pick that was, um, Korean films mm. and on that one, the whaling one, but Bob, I think you picked thirst at the time. Yeah, I believe so. I like this movie a lot, man. It's solid. Yeah, good. And one of the reasons I want to pick it too is in February, I did a top five list of top Korean films. And this one made it, but it was four. And you thought that it should be much, much higher. <laughs> and uh, and then and you thought that my number one didn't deserve to be there, shouldn't have been on the list. And so I kind of defended it with this film a little bit because I knew that you liked this film a lot. So I'd be eager to like discuss some of those topics as well about like what is horror and like how some a lot of like I feel like South Christ. Korean horror <laughs> like uh, blends a lot of different kind of genres yeah, like it's totally. never one kind of thing. And I feel like this fits that really well. Um, so I'd like to talk about that at some point, too. Yeah, yeah, we can get into that. It, it's one of those things uh, where if, if I understand correctly, Korean filmmakers try to in, in, incorporate like every emotion in, in their films, you know, it's not supposed to, yeah, it's not as like straightforward. Yeah. 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 Straightforward Um, horror. Yeah. Which this movie right here definitely has some very horrific scenes, but it's also got some like family drama. It's a love story. It's uh, it's got some very conflicted characters that are dealing with, you know, uh, uh, themes of like self-sacrifice and selfishness and, you know, like religion is obviously at play here with the main character being a priest. Yeah. There's a lot of layers in this movie. There's a lot to peel back. And I feel like every time I watch it, I get a little bit more from it, um, Mm -hmm. which is, you know, one thing that I like about it for sure. It almost feels like two different movies slammed together too. Cause it's like, like most Korean movies seems to be a little bit long. I think it's like two hours and 15 minutes ish. Yeah. And there's, there's a certain point where you feel like the movie could end and then it doesn't. And then you've got like another hour left. <laughs> it's like a whole, <laughs> yeah. that's when it yeah. turns to like straight horror, that is, you know, is there's like a certain <laughs> turning point. Um, I don't think any other lot. turning point would work for you, Bob. You have <laughs> traditionally <laughs> yeah, not have very rock horror. solid patience when it comes to length of movies, True. but it definitely becomes more horror. And this is something I want to touch on because it definitely becomes more like direct horror towards the end where it becomes more gory and things like that. But that was one of the criticisms you had for parasite being labeled a horror film. And that like the beginning was very lighthearted and like very like mm black comedy and that the swing didn't come toward like you know the last the back half like the Mm -hmm. last hour but like i feel like this like yes it's about vamp like a vampire but one of the things i love about this movie is that that's hardly like the focus in a way like the dude doesn't have fangs for teeth they don't talk about his lore or like where it came from it's almost just like oh yeah you're a vampire now and like how does that affect your life they treat it 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 really does feel the the here and now in terms of his grappling they treat it yeah so like that doesn't really bring out the horror aspect yeah it is a virus and he yeah. takes his medicine yeah. which is the blood essentially well yeah. okay so let's start let's let's start from the beginning here because like my like i like always i had like some some questions about this movie sure. like when when i do overseas movies like this i i always kind of struggle to stay abreast of what's happening because there's a lot of cultural things that there, i just have no hope of getting yeah um and there's i'm wondering like i don't know i, I felt like a little bit um I'm just a little bit confused towards the beginning when, okay. uh, because it seems like the cutting in this movie, like the way things transition is really sudden pretty much throughout. And uh-huh. I wasn't really prepared for that. So when, um, what's his name? Uh, uh, Sang Hyun. 
the Song priest. Hyun. Yeah, the priest. Yeah. When our priest Song Hyun goes uh, to this study to, you know, I, I, I was unclear what that what that was. It was like, oh, we don't believe in that experiment or whatever. And I, I wasn't sure if they were okay. They're trying to heal these people. What's going on? What what is yeah. he doing there? Like, so he what happens? And it took me a while to really figure out that this is what happened until they like explicitly say so much later. Um, is that he had blood transfused into him with this disease that also happened to have a vampirism strain, like the the whatever a viral vampirism, basically. Well, so, yeah. So what happens is, so he he's a priest and he works mostly like in the hospital wing. So he goes and he talks with people, but he also gives people their last rites. And we see that a couple times where people yeah. are dying, they've gotten into an accident. He gives them their last rites, but he also just kind of works in the hospital. So that's like in his realm, mm-hmm. and um, and he had some interest in like being uh, maybe being a doctor, maybe maybe at one point because right. his um it, like uh, his, his mentor or priest or whatever yeah it says like i told Cardinal you like you should have gone to school for it or whatever i told you uh, to be a doctor but you didn't yeah know. but he's a he's a priest now so he's like i want to help people so what he does is he goes to this um place in south africa where mm-hmm. or i think or somewhere in africa where they are um trying to cure this uncurable disease it's called the emmanuel um, virus and they're right yeah they have like the, they're trying to find a, a, a vaccine which feels very i'm trying relevant. to under like what what can, yeah really uh what kind of gr- like grabbed me about this was i was unclear like so pretty much if you sign up for the study you are signing up to die at that point is that Hi. You're yeah, they subject, talk about yeah, yeah. You're and, like and a there's human a zero percent. There's a hundred percent mortality rate. So he's signing yeah. up to die in the name of medical he, science, I guess. Well, he says that uh, uh, he has God to protect him. You know, he's a man of man of faith, and and God is with him and will protect him from dying. And and throughout the course of this movie, uh, also I didn't I had to research this. I didn't know this offhand, but Emmanuel uh, in Hebrew means God is with us. So he kind of, you know, there's a correlation there, but you know, you could say watching the course of this movie that through the blood transfusion, like he dies on the table and they give him the blood transfusion and he does, uh, come back to life. He's resurrected. You know, you could say that's, uh, that God did intervene, you know, his faith paid off potentially, but he's also, I mean, kind of, yeah, (laughs) but then it it leads to him abandoning the faith. So how much, yeah. yeah, And that's, I think that's what's so interesting about it because he is so dedicated to the faith that he's willing to go die and and also wants to help people which is mm-hmm. a huge internal like he is he is not necessarily doing this for himself but right. he also takes people's confessions and at the very beginning of this movie before he even goes to the mon- uh, the, the place to get the tested yeah. on he takes a woman's confession and he's saying like people who join this, like become a priest or a nun, or he's talking to a nun at the time, like hate, hate themselves essentially. And so he, you can tell already this man just like beats up on himself. Like yeah. he, 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 well, he self flagellates even. <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. And so he um, is just trying to, to like be the best self he can be because he just ultimately hates himself. And he ultimately like says that outright essentially. Mm -hmm. So a lot of this is like guilt driven. Um, And so he is like very deep in his faith. I feel like um, from the very beginning. And it's, it's interesting to see how that falls away throughout this movie because of certain things that happened to him. Yeah, yeah and it's not it's just like, like they you can blame it on the the vampirism or whatever, but there's there's, there's a little there's more to it. Like, there's happen, debatable yeah. parts of that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> he's he's not like a black and white character. He's very much uh a believer, um, but he's a he's a very conflicted person. He's a real person. These characters are like yeah, that's, well yeah, yeah, that is interesting. And, and there's a lot of conflict within them. It's uh it reminds me of Father what's his fucking name from it? The Exorcist. Uh Karis. Father Karras and like his, yeah. he, he was grappling with his faith a little bit, yeah. but his, his struggle was that he wasn't like all the, all the pain and suffering or whatever he saw around the world was, it seemed like it was dragging him down and making it hard to be faithful. Whereas this guy is using his faith as a way to like, at least at the beginning, he's using his faith as a, a, a sort of like a, a reason to go 
even deeper into the dark. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Which yeah. is interesting. But. Yeah. And also as he, uh, as he, you know, he comes back to life, people uh, regard him as like uh, a saint, you know, because he literally died and then came back to life seemingly because he was a man who believed in God and his faith. He's like a papal him. celebrity. Yeah. And he, I like the, uh, <laughs> the imagery they play around with here. Cause he looks very much like the classic universal monsters, invisible man with like his head wrapped up in bandages. Yeah, he gets all wrapped hands. up. That's a pretty cool look. Yeah. yeah. When I was watching that scene, like before, before he leaves before he like basically dies on the, on the operating table yeah. basically uh, and then comes back to life instantly um and people are like oh, time of death this and then he starts moving again so he's like oh shit he starts he immediately starts by saying a prayer yeah he's praying <laughs> yeah that's right he was saying a prayer and but but even before that he like when they were detailing like what happens to the body i was like so what is he doing here and then it showed him just like like bursting with like pustules and shit and his n- fingernails coming off and shit and i'm like so is this not our lead character? What's happening right now? <laughs> yeah. I was very confused about what's yeah. going on. Yeah. Um, this movie, I, I, I like, took some no, turns for sure. There's no clear, like bad guy. Um, you, th- you think maybe there is toward the end that I feel like every character in here is very gray. Um, he's definitely the one who we follow the most and we get to see the most layers, but um, man, there's so much to dissect in this movie. I guess we should get through the synopsis a little yeah, bit. Just, yeah, um, let's, let's try to because it's, it's it, quite yeah. a bit happens. So, so now he's a saint. So he's a saint and people come to him for prayers like, oh, I'm sick. Please pray for me. So this woman comes to him at one point and it turns out that he knew this woman and her son when he was a child. So yeah. the situation is there's a mom, her son has cancer. He knew the boy or he knew the son as a boy. And they also have a girl that they adopted who essentially mm-hmm. was just abandoned at their house, mm-hmm. um, who they have taken in. And then she married the woman's son. So you have like the mother-in-law, then you have the son who has cancer. His name is Kang Wu. And then you have the woman who is now his wife. Her name is Teju, but she grew up with them, like all of them. Like, so she, she knew all each other's she's kids. Like adopted she's, into the family and then marries yeah. into the family, basically. Yeah, she is, um, it. she's not into it either. <laughs> like, <laughs> no. She's very much not into it. And it's easy to see why from the beginning, like her introduction is pretty clear that uh, not only is she resentful, but she kind of has reason to be because yeah. as yeah. much as they had, like the mom took her in, gave her a job and, but like the, the payback was that she like what, how she paid them back was by being a surrogate daughter to a certain extent. And that meant marrying her son who is a, yeah. just an asshole. Yeah, they treat <laughs> her Almost like, like the guilt. maid. They, they, it's like, very much a like of, guilt. Yeah. She's yeah. like a built in. It's like, she's a, a, a mail order bride or something, or she's kind there of. kind of against her will, but kind of be for security and that sort of thing. Yeah. She's a part of the family, but they don't treat her as such. They treat her as right. less than, uh, which yeah. is, yeah. She, at she, one she, point she even refers to her. She's like, I took her in as like my own daughter as like a puppy. Like she refers yeah. to her almost as a pet, like, Oh, it was abandoned. I fed her. And, but they hold it over her head right. constantly. Like, Oh, you're not getting him his water bottle. I fed you and I took care of you. Like yeah. anytime the mother-in-law gets drunk, she just like, which is totally holds it over <laughs> her head. Yeah. yeah um, the son, He's not cruel necessarily. He's just a huge like goofball. Um, yeah, <laughs> he's Cooter not a respectable <laughs> man. He's more <laughs> of a he's like a man child. Like she treats him yeah. uh, more like a son than a husband almost. Like she has yeah, to it's look like, after him. It's yeah. almost like he like like he was like gifted a a puppy like in the form of a wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's like, he treats her as such like she's his plaything, not really a person. And he's, he has no aspirations to do anything himself. He, it's, he, he himself is like, he's just a nothing person who That's true. only they really will. thinks about himself and, uh, has absolutely no empathy for anybody. He's, he's like, um, He's like Buster Bluth. <laughs> kind, kind of, of yeah. yeah. Kind of. Because they live with the mother-in-law and she owns the business. So she owns a dress shop that Teju, the wife, works in um, and they live with her. So, yeah, he is just like a huge man. He like he doesn't have a job as far as we know. Well, because he has just, cancer, presumably. And it's like, yeah, everything every, like that true. gives him license to do anything. he Like, it, whereas like if he was like a, a healthy person, he might be expected to go out and get a job, but he's not expected to do that. I can't tell if it's because of the cancer or just because of the sheltered nature of his relationship with his mom. But either way, like it, it's like whatever 
whatever responsibilities he might have had if he was a healthy man, they go way the fuck out the window. And he, yeah, makes, they make no effort to give him any responsibility. He is like even right down to like refilling his water bottle and shit. He has yeah. a maid to do that for him because he's mm-hmm. sick. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? It was a marriage to the beast. It was indeed. So what's so what's and so th- that's how Sang Hyun comes into their lives because he's asked to pray for them, but he's like, oh, also I knew you as children, so they invite him over. Now this is interesting. I like this because he so he had his operation six months prior. So when he technically got the vampirism, it is not awakened. Like he doesn't show any kind of the symptoms or anything until he goes over mm-hmm. to their apartment for the first time. And when it actually awakens or when he starts to transform into this different kind of person, quotation marks, is when he, the Teju is on her period and he says something like, oh, yeah. I just I caught a whiff of blood. blood in the air or whatever. <laughs> and that Around awakens. Here that means big money. So a lot of the like vampirism in this movie is tied to the sexuality. Um, oh, yeah. And it's how a, this... Woman affects much. him. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I I love that because it really is just like this almost toxic love story. Um, just draped in vampirism, I guess, like through right. this lens of vampirism. But it's really just this toxic love story. Yeah, it's really a story of a guy who, you know, has pretty much reached the upper echelons of the only world he's ever been in, which yeah. requires so much sacrifice from him. And he's so like uh, conflicted about his place in the world that when he gets introduced to this woman who he's attracted to all of a sudden it like it becomes too big of a temptation for him. But in this movie, it gives us the, the point of view or the, the excuse of, of him being a vampire. Yeah. But th- th- that's the one thing about this movie. That's a little different than other vampires that I can recall from, from movie history, which is that it's so inextricably tied together. It's 100% both of those things. Do you know what yeah. I mean? Like you can't really have both the one without the other in this case. And that's really what the focus of the movie is, is it's not so it's not that he can't control himself around blood. It is that, but it's also that he can't control himself around this woman, this woman, not even every woman. It's this woman, which is interesting, but that's an interesting take in general is that like, okay, so like applying that logic to Dracula was Dracula, you know, a man's like a, a vampire, like hunting prey, or was he like like unable to control himself around women as well as or around you know sexual objects of desire just yeah. as much as as the need for blood? I don't know. I just like retroactively looking at that. That is like a new piece of canon. I think that they establish in this that makes it pretty unique. Yeah, and and she awakens that in him, and then and the th- and it becomes this thing where you're right. He uses it as, as an excuse. Uh, but before that, he would like he he drinks blood from a coma patient. So he's still trying yeah. to be like. So once he's awakened from her, he finds that um, the first time he does it, there's a victim actually from a car crash, and he gets a little blood on his hand and he licks it, and he finds that that actually heals the blisters from the disease he got. So he finds out that whenever he actually drinks blood, he is cured of all ailments. Right. He gets younger. He doesn't have to wear glasses, and so he starts craving it more and there is a coma um ward uh, yeah there's a coma ward where there's a guy who he knew before he went to a coma and he just drinks that guy's blood and like it doesn't kill him or anything he just goes in there he's able to drink yeah, his, yeah. a little drinks bit of blood and it's IV no tube, so there's like and he no just violence it. at all yeah there's no yeah. violence the guy's in a coma and he also like before he went into that coma th- we saw on screen he was telling the priest like uh, about how happy he was to share a meal with some people that were starving or share, like, yeah. give a cake to some starving give children. Give a cake away, yeah. Um, so he was like, oh, so he's happy to feed people in need and I'm in need. I need this very specific kind of food and yeah. this guy can provide it and I think he'd be happy to provide it. So he like, he finds this way to justify it for himself to keep himself alive though. Mm. And I don't know, and he doesn't seek any sort of real treatment or anything like that. He just kind of like secretly does his thing and tries to control it, which he fails at hard. (laughs) Now, another good turning point at this point to just another layer is the one person he does kind of tell this, uh, tell like, oh, I'm a vampire and I'm dealing with this, is his mentor priest, Father Priest Roe or whatever, who is an old blind man Mm -hmm. 
he wasn't always blind though. He's got like cataracts or something, some glaucoma or something. Um, and so they, they bring it up before. And so at first this priest seems really sympathetic, like, Oh, he's really trying to help this guy out and understand and not shun him. And so he feeds him from his body too. So every time that this guy has to drink blood, it's nonviolent. He doesn't want to hurt anybody. He doesn't want to kill anybody. But what happens is, is um, the priest tries to take advantage of him a little bit. And that's where his faith kind of starts to fall away. Um, aside from the temptation of the woman, he kind of like loses his faith because the mentor he realizes is just as greedy and selfish because the mentor asks for to become a vampire too. He wants to drink his blood so that he can see <laughs> like he he's like <laughs> i don't know i didn't take that as him trying to take it i mean he did want to like see obviously and maybe that was a, i i feel like he was tempted by that as a priest like i don't know i i didn't see it as like um as anything beyond like a guy he specifically says i want to see the sunrise which we know because he's a vampire or if he would be a vampire that would kill him so it's like i just want to see something before i die sort of like a mer- last mercy sort of thing. Um, and there's no, like, we don't like, it seems pretty obvious to us because of the lore of vampires that that makes uh, you a pretty evil person, <laughs> at least like yeah. just on, on a baseline level. That's what we assume, but there's no, not, that's not necessarily true. So I th- could see an argument where like he could do that for the guy, but eventually or not eventually, but in that scene, what happens is, he did not basically denies him of the right to do that. He sucks the blood of his mentor and then stabs him in this really fucking crazy way. He has a corkscrew, which he uses as a whatever yeah. knife, vampire super strength to straighten out in one move. It was really fucking cool. And then he stabs him in the heart, which I, like to me, that's more evil, way more evil than like, turning a guy into a vampire so he can like watch a sunrise before dying. Well, no, I think it was the correct. <laughs> I think he realized it was like kind of, bullshit i think it's where he kind of like lost faith in his almost hero yeah. or like his cornerstone for faith it happens a little bit later in the movie where he kills him where he asks for absolution first mm-hmm. uh, yeah for having killed and then he kills again which is kind of ironic like he com- he's completely yeah. washing his hands of faith at that point it's true uh, well because there's but there's a couple reasons why because one the father is willing so the guy is blaming all his lust and everything on vampirism. So it gets to the point where he kills the Teju's husband in order to have her for himself. And he has That's, excuses like, oh, he's beating you and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But really, he's blaming it on the vampirism. Like, oh, I'm lustful. and so, But he confides in the priest. So he feels like the priest knows that this is an evil aspect. Like it makes me desire women. It makes me kill people. So he, that's almost like the final test for him. He's like, father, you give me absolution. I'll make you a vampire. So the father gives him absolution, but he's like, you, you still want to be a vampire knowing that it like to him, it was forced Mm -hmm. on him. Like, Oh, I didn't ask for this blood transfusion. I just got it. But father, you are like desiring it. And you know that it makes me kill people and less for women. And, and you're willing to give up, give up your whole faith and everything you've dedicated your life to just so that you can see you're an old man and everything. So I feel like that's really where his faith gets like completely shaken. And that's where like he kind of abandons the church completely at that point. Yeah. I you, didn't may, see, you may be right. I didn't see him Sorry. as like blaming this, uh, this lust or like, the fact that he killed anybody on the vampirism, I, I didn't really read it that way at all. Cause he finds out that, uh, Teju is, uh, you know, allegedly being harmed by her husband, which she is right. self harming and then finds out that she can manipulate the priest very easily. If she just lies and says, yeah, my husband is hurting me. Um, so yeah. he basically frees her from her shackles, you know, her husband by killing him for is- her. Uh, and that was so weird because like, okay, there's this, like the scene where he gets killed is, um, they're on, they're, they're fishing on a lake at night because it's illegal to fish and they got special permission or some shit from a friend of theirs. And so, so it's, um, the priest, uh, Teju and Teju's husband, uh, Kongu. Uh, Kongu, yeah. And, um, they're sitting there and there's very clearly a conversation happening between the priest and Teju, Teju about, 
uh, him wanting to kill Kongu and Kongu's just sitting there like, what? <laughs> like <laughs> he has no idea what's going on and they're sitting there and she's arguing against King's like, no, you can't hurt him or whatever. But is that, so do we think that's a ploy or do we think that that's, no, she says you can't stab him. So he was going to drink oh, did I his blood. That? And she said, no, you can't because if they find the body, she sa- she specifically says, no, you can't because it's going to show up in the autopsy specifically. So she's trying. So she's trying to, pl- he's okay, just so trying to get revenge. Yeah. But she doesn't she's want him the, to be sucked. Dry. She's like the mind, but he's the muscle. So gotcha. she's like, she knows he can't swim. So they take him out to the water and that's this the was, whole ploy. Man, yeah. what am I'm so sad. That, so the way that works out is like, he says later that um, when he went underwater with this guy using his vampire swimming, I guess he goes underwater with, with Kangu <laughs> and uh, says he found, found a submerged village and put yeah, him in a, a closet with there. a stone on his chest yeah, so that he couldn't escape. But like, I really wanted to see that, and I was like, really, like, kind of bummed out that they never they alluded to it, but they never showed it, and I was like, ah, man, what that could have been a really beautiful scene if they had gone for it. Uh, yeah, a little regret there, but yeah. Uh, yeah. So I guess so. Let's let's talk about Teju for a minute though, and Kangu. So Teju is like kind of an Eve character in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> she's like bitter Eve. So she's yeah. she's offering. She's manipulating our pri- the priest or whatever a penitent uh, you know good man or whatever who would who gets laid down his life for for humanity and for his faith and so on. Uh, but he's clearly attracted to her, and he's uh, God, he can kill pretty much anybody he wants to because he's a fucking vampire and nobody knows yeah. it. So, like, I guess she's angling to be his familiar or whatever. But like, it seems pretty clear that not only is she like at first she's like yeah i need i just need a she wants a companion just like he does and she's attracted to him and some on some level without his glasses she says he looks sexy yeah. or whatever yeah they and start then, having an affair before she knows he's a vampire right, so she's exactly. not trying to get anything from him other than yeah like she finds him attractive companionship he kind of comes on to her first and then and she's, she's just pretty like pretty forthright it. about not having faith about not like giving a shit about you yeah know, morality. So she's like she's yeah. totally fine she's been shat on her whole life so she feels justified in like kind of like fucking over this guy's whole history by taking advantage of his situation or otherwise just like pursuing her own desires and pursuing his desires together and you know like what i i don't have any strong feeling about whether or not that's you know the right thing to do or not because she's clearly in a terrible situation and I don't know, and he, if if you don't believe in God, and there's a guy, I don't know. It it's a it's really com- really complex. He's he's clearly conflicted about that, but she's not. She becomes conflicted when she finds out he's a vampire, but only for a minute. <laughs> like <laughs> only for like one scene, she runs away and she's scared, and then she's like, "Okay, so you're a vampire and you can control it. What else can you do? You can jump between buildings. I want to do that." <laughs> and so she starts. Well, like, yeah, that's so his temptation is he wants to help people, but then he's tempted by lust. Okay. Yeah. She, at first she used to just like fine to have a companion and it's like not against her morality. Cause she's right. like, I'm not like, I'm not religious or anything. So I, whatever, like I just, you know, I'm trying to, I'm tired to be treated like shit, shit. So her temptation though is the power. Right. So they both give it. I like the idea how this movie turns because it does they, make her out to be more like the manipulator. Oh, she's kind of the evil one. But really, they just both give into their temptations. He gives completely into his lust and have sex with a married woman, kills her husband, you know, takes her for his own. And she completely gives into her temptation where she's been shot on her whole life. She like has never been able to stand up for herself, has been taken, taken advantage of. Right. And now she has power. So she completely gives into that. And she's like, I don't care about I hurting think, people. Like I don't care about anything. That's like, that's definitely the, like, and that's the most interesting thing about the movie is like, it does this, like I, I'm trying to think of, there's a very clear allegory that I'm, I'm struggling to come up with. Uh, in terms of movies, there's some, several movies where this is the case, but they accelerate each other's descent into amorality yeah. is what happens. So first it's, it's, um, it's kind of her, but not really by any malicious like intent. They just are both attracted to each other. He's going through a whole thing and he's like <laughs> weakened by it, or at least uh, certainly psychologically and at, at times physically. 
and he gives into his temptation and that so that, that that removes him from the cloth his acceler his higher a tier of of morality is knocked off the board basically and then in return his like you said her lust for power that he has then accelerates their descent towards uh, away from like being okay well i'm going to be a moral vampire who you know only drains blood of coma patients who I know would be okay with it. She's the one that turns the page on that. As soon as she becomes a vampire, she starts murdering folk and she has no qualms about it at all. Yeah. Um, and he's like, why do you give a shit? Like, just go ahead and kill. like, so like they're clearly pushing each other down this path, down this funnel that like leads to their entire, de- their destruction. It has to lead that way. It's a like a breaking bad story where they're like, like, each like step is taken by a different character, but they're just dragging each other forward down the same dark ass path. Yeah. So I think that's fucking great. And the way that like, like you said, or somebody said earlier, it's like you could have stopped after step one of that process and made a pretty compelling movie. But the fact that it keeps going <laughs> and that it like has that power, power shift a couple times is, is yeah. pretty good. I think I like how they, these two characters sing young and, and Taiju, they both, uh, start off as orphans. Like at the beginning of the story, we find out um, uh, that uh, Taiju, you know, was abandoned by her family and then basically adopted by this other family and marries into the family. Um, Sang Yun uh, is an orphan. And I, I assume they don't explicitly say this. I don't believe, but I assume that he's sort of like taken in by the church and given like, you know, a foster home by the church and then decides to take up the cloth because that's like kind of what he knows and what he's been brought up in. And he's got a sense of I think his mentor is basically who raised him. Yeah. For, yeah. For his father figured in lack of any other sort of, so he's provided figure, with yeah. a sense of family and, you know, comfort and whatnot. Uh, same as Taiju, but just by a different type of family. And they both sort of like go about their lives and then they, they reach, you know, however old they are. And then, and then via this family, uh, they, they sort of like cross paths once again, and uh, and they both have like become these completely different people. Like one has chosen like sort of a, a path of self sacrifice, and the other one has chosen just like fallen into like a, a fear more or less. It seems like she she just stays. She's with a this, prisoner. <laughs> yeah, she stays with this family because it is all she's known. And and yeah, they provide like basic needs, you know, roof over head and a sense of belonging. But they do, they don't treat her well at all. She just like f- stays there with them because it's all she knows and she's scared to leave and like also like at night she just uh she tells her family that she's sleepwalking but she like goes on these long runs in the middle of the night barefoot and like she's got these calluses on the bottom of her feet because of you know running on asphalt for however long at a time and she, it's like a you know she's quite literally it's running, a coping mechanism yeah and she's literally running away from her problems and she's doing this yeah to cope with her problems instead of instead of like really dealing with them and saying like hey i'm not happy i have to actually change my life um mm-hmm. So like she's not dealing with these problems and there's there's Which, this one like really beautiful scene uh, right after uh, uh, Sang Hyung finds out that he's like a vampire and he's got powers and stuff um, where she's running in the middle of the night and he like swoops down and like picks her up off the asphalt, steps out of his shoes and like places her in his shoes. And yeah. It's yeah. Sort of like offering her that sense of like, you know, uh, protection and stability that she's getting from this family that essentially is abusive, but he's offering it um, in a different way in his way. And, and, you know, they sort of build this beautiful relationship out of that. Um, but then it spirals out of control when she gets uh, sort of this lust for power that, that he can offer her. Well, you, yeah. Um, but yeah, it's just, <laughs> it's like an interesting metaphor. I thought the whole, the whole shoe thing and how they both start as orphans and sort of take different paths for the same reason, essentially. It's a, uh, so, uh, yeah, read. it is very bizarre indeed. Very bizarre. I wanted to touch on that because this, like, I think this film has a lot of layers and it's beautifully shot and stuff like that. But what locked me into that is talking about that scene and where it goes from there. The thing that really like keeps me coming back to this movie and like, just like embedded itself in my brain. There's that scene. And it's funny because I was talking to my Korean friend about it. She really likes this movie and it's a very kind of like sexy movie. Um, you know, they like, it's very sexual. Yeah. There's um, a, some pretty good, pretty explicit shit. Yeah. Going on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But she was saying like, she was saying that that scene that Rob was saying, it is very beautiful where she's running and trying to be free. And he kind of like, he shows like his strength. He like picks her up and places her in his shoes. Mm-hmm. And she was saying like, to me, like, despite like all the, 
the, like the sexual things going on in this movie, like that's the sexiest scene, like mm. because of like him comforting her and stuff. And I was like, that's really interesting because my favorite or like the scene that really resonates with me that I find very kind of like sexy or whatever is the ending scene. The very ending scene mm -hmm. is because what happens is throughout the rest of this movie, you know, Teju kind of spirals out and it's easier to paint her as more of like the villainous character. She plays mm -hmm. crazy really well, this girl <laughs> or the actress or whatever she's. So um, it's easier to paint her as a more evil kind of character because the priest specifically says like, I don't want to hurt people. And she stuff has like no that. conflict. Once but she, she has no conflict. She even says like, is it, is it a sin for the Fox to eat the chicken? Like she's just kind of like that's living like, this new life or yeah, whatever. But that's like, a Nazi talking point. That's well, not no, like, yeah, I know, know I know. But that's <laughs> like her, it doesn't bother her. So she has to drink blood. So she kills people and she drinks their blood and she indulges in it. And so it's easy. And she also manipulates the priest. Like there are more explicit times where it's easy to see she's just straight up lying and manipulating mm -hmm. him. So it's easier to paint her as the evil character. But what happens is, is that becomes too much for him. And just, he, he loves her and he like wants her. And even toward the end, he says like, I would have lived my whole, I wanted to live with you forever. But this ending scene is so goddamn beautiful. I love this ending scene. So he has had enough. Um, she goes killing and killing and she threatens to leave him at one point, but like, she's just kind of blowing smoke a little bit. And so they end up killing a bunch of people in their house. And like, we have to leave. The cops are going to find us. Like we have to go start somewhere else. So he drives the car and she falls asleep in the car. Mm hmm. And he drives out into the middle of nowhere, literally to the coast on one side and out everywhere else is just um, nothingness. So mm -hmm. she finally wakes up. The sun is like just starting to come out. Like it's a, a little bit of light and she realizes what's happening. So she goes through this whole panic mode. So she's like, Almost, she tries to run away. Oh shit, I'm in the middle of nowhere. Then she tries to get in the trunk, but the, oh my God, I love it so much. She always tries to save him too. So despite the fact that she's manipulated him and says like, I'm going to leave you like we're done or whatever. She always tries to save him. So she tries to put him in the trunk first. She tries to like do all these things. And finally he like throw it. Like he foils all her plans and she accepts like, we're going to die. The sun's about to come up. We're going to gonna die and the last thing that she does he's sitting on the hood of the car or yeah he's sitting on the hood of the car she goes to the trunk she gets out her bag she throws everything out of it and she brings over the like one of the few things that she packed from her home to carry on with her is his goddamn shoes from that night and she puts them on and they're sitting there together and you realize like yes like she actually did love him. Like, yeah, she manipulated and stuff like that, but she wanted to be with him too. Like one of the few things that she took with her were his shoes from that night that he gave her. And they're sitting there together with the same shoes and they die in each other's arms essentially or whatever. And that I'm stroking baby. I'm always stroking. <laughs> but uh, oh, that man. scene. So like when she pulls out the shoes and they're sitting there with the shoes on that to me was like, cause you're yeah, wondering, like, did, she, did, yeah. did she ever love him? Was she just and, using him for the power? But she did. She did love him. On and top it was of just that. a toxic relationship, but I love it so much. Oh, it's so beautiful. There, and there's, there's even more on top of that because you forgot to mention, that in the car is Mrs. Ra, yeah. the, the father, uh, her her mother in law, who has already figured out, even though she is in like a almost a vegetative state, but like still conscious and able to look around and stuff and move one finger because she got some vampire blood, some like yeah. dropped in her food, <laughs> which was really weird. I thought she was going to turn into a vampire too and beat the shit out of both of them. <laughs> yeah, me too. That's what I thought. Was, that's where I thought that was going, but uh, no, she's still kind of like like unable to move mostly. So he, they pack her up in the car because I guess they still care enough about her to not want her to like, you know, be fucked over or yeah. certainly don't want That's her to That's a cultural like, thing. They take care of their mother. Yeah, like, they, yeah. Yeah. They don't, I also don't want her to blab, I'm sure, to anybody yeah. else that they would have well, to Well, they could her. kill her and eat her. But exactly. Yeah, they they actually take but care of her the whole time. Right. They feed her. Yeah. And, and feed her she's and there. She's in the car watching the sunrise with them, specifically in the car watching them on the hood as they yeah. evaporate into dust. And um, she's got, he placed like a 911 call or something under her finger. He placed a, a phone 
for her to be able to like watch them die, get her poetic justice for her son's murder, yeah. which, which she figured out and that, or which she figured out by basically pretending to be comatose long enough to find that out. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I mean, like just add, adds a little bit of weight to that, to that, uh, what you were saying. I think I figured out who, like what story this reminds me of. This is a archetypal Bonnie and Clyde story, actually, yeah. where you have, um, this woman in an unhappy home situation who meets this dashing dude who she thinks is dashing, who has, has something going for him and has a certain kind of swagger about him. And his, in the case of this movie, his swagger comes entirely from a virus that infected him with fucking <laughs> superpowers, basically. Um, yeah. Anyway. And then they, they sweep each other off their feet and then they just go further and further until they're cornered by the feds. They try and shoot their way out, but eventually they succumb because there's, it was, it was a, it was a suicide track that they were on. Yeah. And to some extent they both knew that, but they like, they couldn't come to terms. And the, the reason that they ended up where they were is because they couldn't come to terms about um, how to continue forward yeah. with their new normal, so to speak. So I don't know. I, th- I that was what I was trying to conjure earlier, but, I wanted to make sure and bring that in there because it is, it's a, that's a romantic story that people still look at as like one of the more romantic stories of all time. But those were real people who really killed a lot of people and like, <laughs> yeah, who did terrible things. Yeah, he yeah. did awful, awful things and we shouldn't really romanticize them. But when you like look at the fact, look at them as a story from their perspective or a story like, like this movie, you sort of identify with these people who murdered a lot of people <laughs> like, yeah. and who had, uh, at least in, in Teju's case, no problem with murdering mm-hmm. people um, because like you said, the Fox doesn't apologize or whatever. It's like, which I was sitting there like, Oh my God, this <laughs> like, the superiority complex is thick with vampires. And it, like, that was the one thing that, um, that uh, the priest had going for him is like his holdover, his only holdover after his morality is shaken is that he still doesn't like he, he he's lost that tier, but he's still on the tier of decency where he can be yeah. a decent, if he's going to be a vampire, he can be a decent vampire. And then that's ta- taken away even further by his cohort, who is um, somebody who he loves. He's in love with somebody who loves uh, abusing the power, abusing him. And uh, eventually, you know, those two things cause a toxic mis- mix that not only ruins the lives of everyone around them, gets them all murdered, but also ends up getting themselves, getting them killed at their own hand because he's still got that morality that it took him almost throttling her to death though, for him to come to con- come to the conclusion that, okay, well, we he, can't survive this. He does kill her actually. I <laughs> yeah, wanted to mention I think this as well. Her, yeah. There's this theme of rebirth in this movie. Obviously like when the priest dies on the operating table at the beginning of the movie, he comes back to life as he is saying a prayer. Um, so yeah, he, I mean, she's so out of control towards the end of this movie that he does actually kill Taiju. Um, and he like lets her lay on the ground for a while. And then eventually either through guilt or, or love or a combination of both. He ends up uh, slitting his wrist um, and letting her drink some of his vampire blood and bring right. her back to life. And, um, you know, she latches on and like does not stop drinking him and like almost. And then they him. do an Ar- and Aurora then, Boris thing. <laughs> like, yeah. Yeah. She, I mean, they're she, sucking each other's wrists. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. They're just, <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> so, uh, she wakes up, uh, and is reborn or, and she also says earlier in the movie that like, she doesn't know when her birthday is. She doesn't know who her father is. She has no real sense of no real sense of self, um, she doesn't know where she came from. Um, so now, you know, he does this and tells her happy birthday and he is, uh, both her lover and her father and father in the sense of multiple, yeah, multiple, uh, meanings of the word now. <laughs> right, he's um, so he's a power diddy. He's a power diddy. Yeah. It's, it's kind of a, it inter- was a marriage to the beast. It's a very interesting layered relationship relationship they have, but she now has this like, a uh, sense of self and she has a birthday and she knows her family mm-hmm. and she takes that newfound identity and just continues to go fucking. Ape I, I forgot about that birthday thing. That's at, that yeah. to me might be the sexy scene where he's like, happy, happy birthday, birthday. Cause she never knew her Damn. birthday before. And she, I was like, that's a good line, bitch. That's <laughs> it doesn't work in any other situation, but happy got birthday. it, man. And actually <laughs> he feeds, he, he kills her. Cause what prompts him to, which is another interesting aspect because I, I still feel like she starts to get painted as like the evil one, but he kills her because she is saying like, please, like, 
send me to my husband. You shouldn't have killed him. Yeah, well, like you're an evil yeah. person. And yeah, what was, was she really feeling guilt at that point? What was no, going no, on? She her? was like trying to hurt him. Yeah. And she's also playing it off for her mother okay. who is, you know, she's not, she's like a vegetable, but she's aware of what's happening. So she's like lying in front of her mother to okay, make sure yeah. because her mother at this point doesn't know that, that she's lo- full on like helped kill yeah. her, her son. You know, Teju was like, she's tough to wrangle in my brain. I was like, so wait, what's she doing now? Because <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> like, yeah. there's a few she, times where she changes on a dime she, with, per, with reason most of the time. But she's yeah. ultimately looking out for number one, you know, looking out for herself. Oh, yeah. um, even if she yeah. does love the priest character, like, like, you know, she wants to save face with her mother and she'll throw him under the bus to do so. Yeah. But it's a star. But also, thing. it's like yeah, not in yeah. front of anybody. It's literally to yeah. hurt him. Yeah. yeah. So like, it's like, she knows well, she like, says it how to, to her, affect him. She says it to her mom, to her mom sitting there. She does. Yeah. But yeah. the mom's in a vegetative state. It's not like they're in like a court of law or anything. No, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah, like yeah, the mom's yeah. actually going to do it. At anything. that point, do right. they know that she's awake or no? Um, I don't, I don't, they do know at that point. Well, yes, she's yeah. awake, but they don't know that she can do anything. No, she can't do anything yet, but, um, yeah. I guess they, yeah, yeah they could really tell her. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. They so. do, but they know that she's aware of shit. Yeah. 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 Well, okay. I thought that they weren't aware. I, I thought that they didn't realize that until she's <laughs> no, sitting there like, blowing, blowing up their spot in front of the, her. No, neighbors. the problem with that was, is they didn't know she got a bit of the vampire blood, which allowed yeah. her to actually move a little bit move before she was in a complete. So they didn't mind saying things in front of her. Cause like she can't talk, she can't do anything. But what yeah. she does is she comes up with the ploy to actually like move her finger to like, and then, well, actually, then it becomes blinking that saves her. Yeah. Like, blinking yeah. in the direction yeah, yeah, yeah. she looks at. And yeah. So yeah. she's aware, so, which she, actually is, she's able to actually, rat him out. You know, she knows. Yeah. Um, I just realized that they 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 uh, foreshadowed her like her eyeball communication earlier in the movie when they talk about how like uh, if you stare anywhere for four four seconds like his the friends that are sitting there playing oh, that, or whatever yeah. like, you know if you stare somewhere at four seconds uh, people naturally all stare at that direction too I'm like, <laughs> yeah. which is exactly how they all discover what sh- that these people murdered her son because she, yeah. they're like. Like she manages to spell the word K L D with her finger, but they're like killed. killed and then she yeah. blinks to say yes. And they said, well, who got killed? And she looks over at a picture of her son and they all slowly turn and look at him. <laughs> <laughs> good work. Like I didn't yeah. realize that until just now, but that's some good, good shit. Yeah. We, that was a cool, like horror scene. I know we got to lay in the Yeah, point. we do. It, <laughs> yeah. If you got anything uh, you want to touch on real quick, do it. And then we'll rate this thing. No, touch I'll talk it. about it in my, in okay. my overall rating. Okay, cool. We're not hosting an intergalactic kegger down yeah. here. Not yet. Uh, Randy, out of five, how do you feel about thirst? Uh, I feel pretty good about it. You guys clarified a few things that I had questions about, uh, just talking it through as happens. Um, I think this is a pretty strong movie, and I feel like, like Rob, I'll probably get more out of it the second watch, maybe the third watch, and I do have interest in watching it again, maybe not right away because it is a little bit of an undertaking. But I think it's got a pretty unique take on things. I, I like the idea of approaching a vampire movie from the perspective of like a, a Bonnie and Clyde archetype and also like playing with faith. And like, like Justin said, there's a lot going on in this movie that you could focus on so much so that it's almost hard to focus. And that would be my critique is like, there's maybe almost more stuff than I can handle going on. Um, I would say that like the central stuff is is strong enough for me to be like completely engaged throughout though. Um, I don't think there's an, enough co- like a ton of cultural differences that really made me like mystified, but there was enough to where like I think it was really came from the characters though that that confused me specifically Teju because she like sometimes she just squirreled out on me. I was like, wait a minute, huh? I don't understand. Um, and I'm just also a slow person. So <laughs> with all of those things combined, I think I have a pretty solid view of this movie um, as being a, I want to say 4.5. I'm going to reserve, I may, I may change to a five on subsequent viewings, but I, I felt kind of overwhelmed as a viewer with this movie at times to the point where I was like unclear, like things weren't clear enough for me to really understand what the drama was in a few sp- scenes. I had to like catch up. I was doing a lot of catch up. Yeah. That's my biggest complaint. Other than that, the acting is, is great. I think like um, the layers are, of, of intrigue are all there. Um, 
I don't know. The storytelling's tight. There's a like, like I mentioned earlier, I keep finding like little bits of foreshadowing that I didn't notice, little bits of metaphor that I wouldn't have thought of, uh, that I didn't think of automatically. And that's the sign of a pretty rich and and good film. So uh, for me, I think that it's got to be a four point five. All right, uh, Juice, how you feel? Yeah, I um, I really like this movie i think it's a beautiful movie thing something we didn't really talk on at one point some of just the style once they're both vampires they paint the walls white um she starts to get more kind of dressed up she's wearing this kind of like really elegant blue dress that stands out and then at one point she like pukes up blood all over the white walls and floors it just becomes really striking whereas before it was maybe a little dull when like he was a priest there was more dull colors and then which when is she perfectly was fitting with the characters too like, yeah yeah the, the evolution of those characters yeah yeah so it looks beautiful. Um, I love um, the ending scene there. It is a very sexy movie. Um, there's a lot of like sex scenes and even some things that aren't specifically like sex scenes like become very sexy. He might have a little Tarantino thing going on. At one point, there's like some toe sucking going on. Oh, just, yeah, like, <laughs> there is toe sucking in this movie. Yeah. Um, He's stroking. I'm always stroking, baby. Um, <laughs> always. Always. So, yeah. Oh, God, I, um, yes. Come with me. Sorry. I couldn't it, help myself. <laughs> it has a lot of things to chew on. and But I do agree. Some critiques. I really, really do like this movie. The acting was great. Um, the same actor who did uh, Parasite. He was in Parasite. He was in The Host. Um, I haven't seen any of the other movies this woman is in, but um, she did a great job, especially when she had to start going like crazy. She had those crazy eyes, man. Um uh, but some critiques, especially that I remember from my first viewing, it was the editing in the beginning and trying to figure out exactly what was going on, like with the disease and like how it affected them later on, because then actually she gets the disease. And so a little bit of that can be muddled. Um and then also there was, I actually will agree with Bob a little bit on this one and where I think some of it can be cut and some of the tonal change as well is when they didn't need to add where they're dealing with the guilt of killing the husband. Cause what happens is it becomes really goofy. The, the husband's so goofy. And Dude, I love be, that. I did. Really? Too. I yeah. did. Yes, I did it. Oh, He's absolute, man. like <laughs> absolute fucking cheese and ass grin. He is. is. So He's got the me. snot coming out of his nose, but I didn't like <laughs> that whole section. Like we're already dealing with, you know, is she just manipulating him? Does he actually want to hurt people? Like there's enough themes going on that I didn't feel like we had to weigh on their guilt of killing. The See, husband. I didn't understand that that was a scene about guilt until like kind of towards the end of the sequence. Like, Oh, okay. So this yeah. is not actually like, I think I thought that maybe he had gotten sucked, his blood sucked anyway. And then he would come back as a vampire oh, or something. Yeah. Like I was trying to apply like the, the existing movie logic to it, but it was instead like an entirely different, kind of sequence a which is a little bit jarring of yeah. guilt in the form of like a goofy looking right. corpse in between Dude, these two while they're trying nose. to have sex yeah hilarious. when they're like banging out he's like yeah. laying yeah. There. i didn't i didn't like it i oh, thought that shit was fucking <laughs> great I didn't like it the first time I watched the movie and anytime I've watched it since I still, I'm like, Oh, yeah. I wish this wasn't in the movie every time. But, um, <laughs> it's a weird tonal shift for me. And also I just don't like that. Go like the goofiness of it too really takes away from me. I don't know. Oh, really? uh, I think and it like was goofy, just another, kind of a, I'm sorry, go ahead. Uh, I was just gonna, it was just another theme that I didn't feel like was needed because it's already so theme he like thematic. Like mm -hmm. there was just another thing that I felt did prolong it unnecessarily. Um, but for the most part, I, I think really, it's part of the descent. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I, it it, it I fits. I'm not saying that it doesn't fit, it's but just it's the just, way that it's shown. Is that? It's the way that it's shown and it's also unnecessary like when we're already dealing with faith and the toxic love and like like we don't necessarily need guilt on top of that I guess because um, he doesn't feel well, any guilt for killing his long -tor term mentor like that almost would have felt more natural to me um, what but anyways um I was going to give this movie a four plus I have to give a half star for the Yabos because man's got a code and there God knows there's Yabos in this movie. There really are. 
<laughs> they're really, they're really, really. They're are. really. Oh are God, yabos. yes, come with me. I will come with you if there's yabos, Aww. and there are. <laughs> um, so four point five from Shaboy Soju, Robert. Right what do you on. think about thirst? Uh, I love this movie. Um. I don't really have any negatives for it, honestly. It is pretty jam-packed, so if you're not sitting down and really paying attention, uh, the movie will lose you, and it'll lose you pretty quickly because it moves quickly. Um, it's got a lot going on, but I think um, after I'd seen it a couple times, um, like I said, w- with every rewatch, you just get more and more from it, and I think um, that's probably one of my favorite things about it is it just has so many layers, and there's so much going on here. And it's a beautifully crafted movie, and I love how they treat the horror like with respect. Like it gets really gruesome towards the end. So you've got like a really solid payoff. And then it, it also, uh, the love story pays off so beautifully uh, with that ending scene. It just like really, like despite all of the chaos and destruction, um, it just lands on this like such a, such a wonderful, like heartfelt note. Um, yeah. And I don't know, just like the whole package um, is a fantastic uh twisted bizarre vampire tale and i don't really have many complaints if any that i could that i could come up with at all too uh, long huh bob <laughs> uh it, it is long but i think it's worth it i think this one's worth it anyways yeah. how was your beer um <laughs> none coffee coffee uh oh. it was delicious this is a five for me i got i really don't have any negatives to say so wow all right bob oh. this was your you were saying this is probably your favorite Korean horror film, huh? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know that I have seen one that I like better yet. Anyways, not yet. So, uh, what thirst. about the wailing? It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Um, that's going to put our aggregate at a 4.7 for thirst. Let's go ahead and jump over nice. into our rotten tomatoes segment. See what the critics and users think. Certified fresh to death. All right, boys, we're going to do our Rotten Mater segment uh, right here. And for those new to the cast, what this is, is uh, an opportunity for uh, Juice and Bob to try to the best of their ability to guess what the consensus percentages are on the quality of the film Thirst on RottenTomatoes.com. So we're going to start with our critic score and then move on to our users. Uh, Juice, why don't you start us off with um, our critic score out of 100, 0 to 100 percent. What do you think the critics gave? thirst Generally. um this is a respected uh director um he had old boy had come out before this movie mm-hmm. and but it is a little hard to figure out like what american critics would think of it i think it like it's highly regarded here um so but i still think it's going to be high i'll give it 80 80 percent 80 percent all right bobby what are you thinking I feel like it's going to be a little higher than that. Um, so I'm going to go with an 87. 87. All right. Well, the Korean, uh, the Korean inductee, whatever, the, <laughs> the immigrant that into Korea has got this one on, in the bag pretty easily. This was 81% certified oh, fresh made. Almost a ding-a-ling. God. Almost a ding-a-ling. <laughs> almost almost your bill. ding-a-ling. <laughs> Uh, and uh yeah 87 wasn't too far off the mark either but yeah it's 81 um the critics consensus i'm sorry this was out of 114 reviews to uh, forgot to mention that um the stylish thirst packs packs plenty of bloody thrills to satisfy fans from for both vampire films and director chan chanu park yeah how do you pronounce that park chanu it's in a different order on i know yeah 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 I don't His understand. last name is Park, yeah. I'm dumb. Um, all right, we're going to move fun. on to the audience score now. Uh, Bob, why don't you start us off this time? What do you think, out of 100%, how, how many of these 19,462 people gave Thirst a positive rating? I'll take an 85, Randy. 85, all right. The Back to the Future year, okay. Juice, what do you think? Hmm, I think it's going to be high too, but I it might be lower. 78. 78. Well, you can't beat South Korea for education because Juice is going to take this one too. Uh, 75% actually Woo-hoo! is what this came down to, uh, which is lower than I would have anticipated. Um, yeah. 
I don't know. I, to, to me, I feel like this is a pretty... I feel like the length might affect people. And you got to read. And you know how, you know, mm-hmm. sometimes us Americans, we don't like to read. This is the one negative review that I just beeline to <laughs> when I read. This is... I don't understand what this person is even fucking talking about. This was written in 2018. The, <laughs> the few funny or visceral scenes cannot hide the fact that in the year that the vampire flick has been reinvigorated, this is a major disappointment. Who the, f- what what the fuck are you talking 2018? about? <laughs> 2009? 2018? Like, what, what was it? Breaking Dawn that did it to you? What, what are you talking about? <laughs> Hotel Transylvania 3? <laughs> like, I can't. Ah, huh, okay. What is this person talking He's about? He's probably talking about Underworld. Nobody. Yeah, yeah. The return <laughs> of Underworld. It's reinvigorated. How are you going to do an, a different kind I, of vampire movie when you got Underworlds out there? Well, I'm, I'm <laughs> looking at vampire movies released in 2018, and I don't even recognize But this movie came out in 2009. Either. Look in 2009. What is it? That's what the comment was talking about it says right? november 1st 2018 i know but the year that the vampire movie is invigorated this one is a disappointment so oh like i see what you mean talking okay. about like uh, the year it came out 2008 uh, vampire movies come on guys uh, uh, twilight uh, fucking twilight uh, well let let the right one twilight. in out. <laughs> i'll give it to him on let the right one in that's a great movie okay. but, uh, but like that's one movie <laughs> and i don't i would be very shocked if anybody thought that movie reinvigorated vampires it was a good movie about vampires in the a sea of twilight wannabes so yeah rise of the lichens came out that year oh Oh. that's a good one the wet fart no it's not it's not the good underworld movie (laughs) some motherfuckers are always trying to ice skate up hill perfect timing Sweet deal. Uh, so that's about all we got for Rotten Tomatoes, right, Randy? Was you have that's anything it. else? Cool. I mean, no, no other scores. So no. <laughs> Let's. Uh, I don't know if you had anything else to add, bruh, bruh. Let's go and jump in uh, to our trivia section. It's totally time for trivia. All right, time for the spicy version of trivia, boys. <laughs> um, <laughs> spice. <laughs> that was extra spice. <laughs> So, um, I am going to throw in some trivia, and a couple of these are going to try to play a little game. Um, I'll try to ask the boys some trivia questions, see if they can guess correctly. Um, let's see. We'll start with this. Um, the The movie in Korean is called Bak Tui, and it is it does not mean thirst. That is not uh, the direct translation for this movie. So... Can you guess what do you think? It does not mean thirst. What do you think bok choy means? Is there a multiple choice by chance or uh, <laughs> it's ooh. kind of a wide world of I words out could there? Have. It is related. <laughs> it's related maybe. to the theme of the related movie. Related to the theme. Okay. Damn. Well, f- there's so many uh, themes. Yeah, I know. Like my faith well, okay. Or it's related. Rem- it's rela- I'll give you even uh <laughs> it's related yes. to the theme of vampires. Oh Blood? um fart. Well, uh, damn <laughs> seduction <laughs> maybe it means so bakchui in korean means bat uh, uh, bakchui uh, means bats so hail satan and have a lovely afternoon um, <laughs> so polite hail satan hail satan we're polite around here um <laughs> so yes uh the the this does not mean thirst in korean uh, this movie borrows many elements from Emile Zola's novel. Oh, this is French. Therese Raquin. Teju is named after Therese and Lady Ra is named after Madame Raquin. So I, I guess that's a French novel. I don't know okay. if it's about vampires or not. Um, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Um <laughs> So right. that, so I guess the actor who played Kongu, the husband, um, he's pulling, I guess, a little bit of a Sean Bean here. But it says in this movie, um, the character of Kongu is killed uh, by drowning in in a movie called Sympathy for Mister Vengeance, which is um, which is another movie that this actor is in, uh, the guy who plays in Parasite and uh, the host, the main guy. Mm-hmm. Um, it said he also kills the same character in that movie by drowning. Uh, but both of the movies are directed by uh, Park Chan-ok. 
So yeah. um, he guy's probably tired of being in Bozeman. <laughs> yeah. tired like, of being uh, you're gonna drown again. Fine. Yeah, a, a, I've actually never seen Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance, but uh, it's it's another like Korean hardcore re- revenge or, uh, film. Lady Vengeance uh, is part of the his Vengeance trilogy. Old Boy, Lady Vengeance, and uh, Sympathy for Mr. Vengeance. Ah, uh, okay. A I, damn, I haven't watched. So yeah, I haven't seen those, but I have heard uh, being for the benefit of Mr. Kite. So. I think I'm in a good. I think Sweet. I'm in a good spot. Sweet. <laughs> Apparently, uh, also uh, Park Chunuk uh, uses scissors a lot to kill people, and in this Teju uses spring scissors to drain her victim's blood. Oh yeah, the pruning um, scissors or whatever. Yeah, she works on like the dress shop or whatever. So that's pretty cool. Um, this is the first mainstream Korean film to feature something. So, can you guess? This came out in 2009. This is the first mainstream Korean film to feature. I know. I know. I got this. Do you? What? I think so. Toe sucking. <laughs> Randy. To- Randy says toe sucking. That's, that's a good guess, Bob. That means no. <laughs> uh, well, I want Bob to get a good guess in too. I don't want him to, I don't want to discourage Bob's guess. <laughs> finger sucking. I have no idea. Finger sucking. sucking. So this came out in 2009. It is the first mainstream Korean film to feature full frontal male nudity. Oh. Uh-huh. Ladies. That's unexpected. So that was a good guess. It could be toe sucking too. It I feel like it's got a, like how many movies got toe sucking know. on so them in Karen's general? Can make Tarantino doesn't that movies, pr- prolific. <laughs> <laughs> Shit. Um, they didn't even have Uma Thurman over there. There was... There was one more thing that's kind of interesting. The main character of Song Hyun um, is killed by the Emmanuel virus, a.k.a. Evie, at the beginning of the film. Mm-hmm. At the, um, and at the party near the end of the movie, he spares the character whose name is Evelyn, or Evie for short. Oh, there you go. Yeah. Um, there was one thing I forgot to mention. I took a note on that I thought was cool to this character. Um, he, so he's regarded as like a saint or whatever by a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And he, he obviously, we talked about him hating himself. So before he goes and kills him and his girlfriend or whatever, he pretends to rape a woman just so people will stop thinking highly of him you guys Wait, remember what? that yeah yeah he goes to that little camp where those people love he like, goes to the camp where gathered. the people are disabled and like homeless or whatever that he had been to before and they were mm. all praising him mm. they were like oh the saint the saint please pray for us please heal us yeah, I, I remember seeing that but, but yeah. he doesn't want people to think of him that way because he knows he's kind of like, or he regards himself as like a monster and stuff like that. So before he drives his girlfriend, him out to like be burned in the sun in mm-hmm. order to just completely put to rest that he should not be worshiped. There should not be considered a saint. He goes to back to that disability camp and um, he like puts himself onto a woman um and and she screams oh, and like everybody comes out and shit. it's like no no it, it's literally just to ruin his reputation like he doesn't yeah. actually rape her or drink her blood it's he tells the other one he tells his girlfriend that he was drinking blood um but he makes it look like he was raping the woman he he really just doesn't want people to worship him <laughs> oh you're a monster <laughs> Something I wanted to mention. I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, that, that is, is interesting. That is the end of our trivia section. Whoa. All right. You know what time it is. It's time to go <sighs> hunting. But I forgot my permit. <laughs> <laughs> Let me issue you one here, Randy. Oh, thank you. So we are going to hunt some cooters. Cooter is a character type. And uh, we got to break down the five points. You got to hit at least three of these five points to be considered a cooter. Of course, the more points you hit, the higher cooter ranking level you are. So the five points are sexual deviancy, which we should have a lot of in this film. What? Sexual deviancy, um, smug arrogance, manipulation, attire, and overall patheticness. So I feel like there's a decent amount of candidates for this position. My brain's already locked in on one. Yeah. Who you got, Randy? Kungu. Okay. The husband. Yeah, the husband. Very I mean, pathetic. 
Yeah, like I said, he's basically like Buster Bluth (laughs) without the anxiety. He's too arrogant to be as self self conscious as Buster Bluth is. Uh huh. So, um, sexual deviance, I would give him a pass on that. I don't think he's got much of that going on. In in fact, (laughs) it's explicitly stated that he doesn't really uh, touch her, like he doesn't beat her or whatever. Um, yeah. And I, t- I mean, that means he's not. But they also don't really have forcing sex. upon. Yeah, exactly. They don't have sex, which in you know, in a relationship that was truly abusive in in that way, in a sexual way, that would probably include some sex. So, yeah. Um. Yeah. There's. Uh. So I give him a pass on that arrogance. Like I said, I think it's he's he is so single minded. He thinks nothing of anyone else. Like he has no no ambition to feel the feelings of others. Yeah. Uh, I think that's pretty fucking arrogant manipulation. I don't think he's smart enough to mani- manipulate. So <laughs> another pass. He's pretty, I think he's, yeah, yeah. he's pretty, I think he's just like a fucking clod. He might as well be like, I don't know, one of the snails in that Junji Ito story or some shit. Yeah. Um, uh, let's see what's left. Attire. He, he, mm, He's got like a, a weird little vest on at one point, but it's not it's, egregious. Yeah. I don't think it's like the attire. I think it's his appearance because of his yeah. appearance. The snot specifically of his nose. The snot. And especially in the scene where he's like, and they're doing it intentionally. So it's not yeah. really him, but at least like the, I associate the, the dream version, the guilt version of him with the giant goofy fucking smile yeah. and the <laughs> Such a insane goober. amount of snot under his nose. <laughs> As being pretty attire driven cooterness. And then last but not least is of course patheticness, of which he is like skyrocketing Sorry. off the charts. Yeah. So for me, that's a pretty clear guess. If anybody else has an argument for someone else, I'd like to hear it. Even though she's smoking hot and I love her, but Teju, uh she I think she ranks pretty high on the cooter scale. She she manipulates a lot. Yes, yeah, she is a very answer. manipulative. Very, very manipulative. Um, she is also a sexual deviant. She How? cheats on her husband. Um, she, oh, yeah, she cheats she, on her husband. She is unfaithful, but it's also like a loveless marriage into a family I don't think it's that deviant. treats her like shit. Yeah, she's just unfaithful. Yeah. I think she uses her sexuality to manipulate a bit. I don't know. I think that falls under manipulation. No. I don't know. Like I, it's not, she didn't seduce the guy with the intention of becoming yeah. a vampire. Like you said, I it think was it's all consensual. Yeah. They're all pretty much. I, down I think she, from yeah, go. she just got a, became attracted to him and she has a fucking cooter for a husband. So she's yeah. like, well, hmm. let's fuck, let's fuck father. Yeah, <laughs> I guess we don't want to, we don't want to kink shame. They do have some, at one point she's like, She's like, am I a pervert for liking yeah. this? Like, cause he's biting on her and shit. Yeah. Um, but they're all, cool with it though. yeah so okay fine, all right okay but we can keep going because arrogance i think she's definitely got smug that. arrogance yeah the whole chicken and the once the, she gets a little bit of power the she fox goes line nuts. yeah she does yeah. not like care about human life or like hurting anyone or whatever so i think she's really high on the very high on the manipulation very high on the smug arrogance um and we have a tire, Let's which see. I don't see. Personal. She's looking smoking in those. Like yeah. she, she, they always put her in like that, like blue dress or whatever. That thing looks mm. like dope. I like just the shade that they used on it. It looks really good. <laughs> or just like, just for like cinematography, but yeah. Um, I mean, and she's, cinematography. She's not, <laughs> yes, yeah. It's all about cinematography. Cinematography's got me. Stroking. <laughs> I'm always stroking, baby. And you um, know who does the best uh, cinematography? That was, the best, that was the best. I be stroking <laughs> job. All of, that was the best. Um, and at the beginning she's a little pathetic like when she gets like knocked down when she doesn't like stand up for herself so she starts off kind of pathetic. that's true well i mean she's kind of pathetic but like in a scary way like like it's really more like like a bubbling seething untapped hatred she starts yeah. like she spent there was like a like a two minute scene of her taking those yeah. shears and just like stabbing like her husband, mimicking yeah. stabbing her husband in the mouth as he's sleeping. That's before she, yeah, that was yeah. like toward the beginning. <laughs> That's just her natural state at the yeah. point we are introduced to her. 
that's I don't know if that's pathetic so much as it is like psychotic. Well, like, I'm just like when she gets like knocked down on the ground and she like pretends like she's gonna slap her husband for like disrespecting her, but instead she grabs a tissue and wipes his snotty nose. Like yeah. ah. I don't know. I think like I, mean, <laughs> I think being held captive is a little different than being. Uh, yeah, I don't see her as pathetic. I honestly don't see her pathetic. as a full blown cooter. She she ranks on yeah. a few points uh-huh. or two points yeah. in a way, but those two points are absolutely completely out of the gate and like un- yeah. untouchably high, but I'm not sure she quite has a, a full third element, maybe trace amounts of other elements, but nothing yeah. that I think really. Puts I don't think up. there's a big cooter in this movie. Honestly, not I'm a not, big cooter. No, I, I don't even Kangu is like a light cooter for me. I still don't think he's like full bone cooter. Yeah. I'm not yeah. Not he's not like, seeing it. Maybe like the Koreans don't do cooter as well. You know, maybe it's possible. <laughs> I don't Maybe believe they just that. Don't I think the I think Korean folks could definitely find them a cooter for a movie <laughs> if they wanted to. There was one in Train to Busan that like uh, the, the oh yeah the the rich guy the business yeah, yeah. The, that dude was a cooter for show. Shut All right, up. well, no strong cooter and thirst. I stand by Kangu myself, but All right. yeah. he's he's a bit of a cooter for sure. Yeah, just. Eh. In a not so crowded field, I think he does well enough. But yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, no convincing cooter in thirst. Um, let's go ahead and get into what we've been watching this week. Hey, gang, what you been watching? Time for the social hour, boys. Oh man, we can finally unwind. Uh, <laughs> Let me take uh, off my belt. belt. Take oh man, we take tie. off our professional pantsuit and put on our <laughs> jockey straps. <laughs> Track suit. Let, me, <laughs> let me go ahead and load up on some of these finger foods. Let me get oh some of these p- pigs in a blanket. <laughs> oh shit. Time to socialize, baby. Let Y'all got pork down. rinds in there? <laughs> pork rinds are Ooh. heinous. I'm sorry. Ooh, that, just, fir- that first I, hour I was pork, so. that first sure. hour is full. Yeah. So sorry you guys had to listen to us talk about a movie. If you see Uh, any of the crab cakes, get your hands on them because I love the crab cakes. We have now become the the mullet of um, podcast. (laughs) It's business in the front, party in the back. Oh, you're a monster! (laughs) Welcome to Mullet Cast. (laughs) Oh, my God. (laughs) Party in the back, boys. Let's go. El Camino style. Uh, Let's go. Party in the back. All All right, right, let's party jorts on. Randy, what you been watching? Is it me? Okay, yeah. Yeah. So I actually haven't watched a ton this week. Um, There's really only a couple of films I watched and then mostly just like news and or bullshit YouTube videos that shouldn't be discussed. I will. I'll discuss one, which is uh, internet comment etiquette, which you guys know I'm a fan of. Um, If anybody wants to laugh uh, at some bullshit on the internet, internet comment etiquette is pretty fucking great. I'm a big fan of that shit. I'm a patron on Patreon, which I just don't do <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. So I'm a big I don't believer. like to support anyone. Yeah. I, I really, <laughs> I think, you know, bootstraps, pull them up, that sort of shit, you know? Get you some boots and pull them straps pull, up, son. Just pull on them straps. You'll be fine. Um, <laughs> you pull them. Aside from that, uh, I watched Philadelphia for the first time. You guys seen that? Tom Hanks and uh, Denzel Washington. No, Philadelphia. No, I've never seen that. Yes. I watched Philadelphia. Oh, I have seen that. <laughs> um, yeah. Which, uh, I mean, that, that, that won, that won Oscars after Oscar after Oscar when it came out. So I finally got to check that out. It's about Tom. Uh, I almost said Tom Cruise, <laughs> fucking Tom Hanks, <laughs> uh, play, playing a gay man in the early nineties, late eighties. I can't remember huh. uh, when it was pretty stigmatized and the AIDS epidemic had just started. He gets AIDS, gets fired unjustly from his job. And Denzel uh, is the only lawyer in town who will accept his um, his case and go to bat for him, basically. Huh. It's a pretty good movie. It's uh, dated, I would say, by today's terms. I think I would have probably gotten more out of it if it was uh, in the... If I saw it in the time that it came out, you know? Yeah. But um, it's, it's pretty good. And the acting, obviously, is great. Two of two world-class actors in it. So Yeah. And very, very likable guys to begin, begin with. So there was those. And then on the entire... Polar goddamn opposite side of the spectrum. I also watched Antichrist this week, which I had also never seen before. Oh, Randy. Yes. And um, I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't think it's uh, saying too much for me to say that, um, first of all, 
I was watching when I was watching Thirst after Antichrist. I was like, you know, I want to say this is an explicit movie, but I just watched Antichrist. <laughs> I don't think that's. Right. I don't think it really bothers me. I have um, never seen this film. Okay, well, you're going to because part two is. Um, I don't know when it is. I think it's next week or the week after something like that. I get to pick a movie. Two weeks, yeah. And yeah. I do believe I'm going to pick Antichrist. Oh my lord! You've got a week to change your mind, Randy. I, Please change your mind. <laughs> It's locked in. I like at this point. I just got to do it to Bob. It's locked. <laughs> you just got to what? It's it's just something I got to do to Bob at this point. Uh, Thanks. As man. soon as I yeah. mention it to Rob, Bob's he's like, gonna "No, get, <laughs> Bob's going to get Antichrist and possibly a racer head in like very close weeks. He's, he's going to have he's, having, he's gonna have a rough month in June. You are man. It's going to be a tough quarantine. <laughs> Those are not my movies. Good. That's no. what happens when you turn thirty-two, Bob. The world goes to shit. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> if, if this isn't gone to shit, I can't handle whatever is gone to shit that's for sure well, you're gonna get it buddy and this is what right. you're gonna sound like afterwards ah! whoa Silence. that sounded a little pleasurable mm-hmm. yeah i know <laughs> just like antichrist <laughs> whoa <laughs> nope juice what have you been watching uh we covered alien last week and i popped into aliens the sequel um, hips don't lie. Paxton is like wild in that. It's been a little, <laughs> a little bit since I watched Aliens. Um, I do not. I I don't know. I might get a lot of flack for this, but I am in the camp of Alien. I like Alien more, um, especially having just covered it. The overall look, like I know James Cameron, he's you know good director, or whatever. But the overall look is more dated for sure. Like when the spaceship is flying through space and like into the caves, like it doesn't look as good. It doesn't hold up as well over the years. Um, I'm going to say, I think really, I think it's really adorable that you think that this isn't like a raging issue in the fandom about which one is better. Yeah, some people like go that, back and forth on it, but they're also like yeah, very different I'll, types of movies too, you know? I feel like they are, and it's like generally like it's the more positive. Really? But... I mean, I think it's more crowd pleasing. Maybe that's what you're keying in on. It's maybe, more of like a crowd pleasing movie because it's maybe it's like action or more action. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I, I, so I think there's those two movies are like, neck and neck for amount of love they receive in my experience yeah i'm in the alien camp alien is superior in my opinion um uh, better acting um uh, holds up over time well like just the general look and set design so yeah it was cool like still good still good to watch but it was harder for me to watch them back to back i almost would just let them like fade away and then like watch aliens you know yeah. um, they don't to me they don't work well sandwiched together um they just they're too different um so i watched that and actually then i went on vacation and i don't i so i think that's all i'm still working through community um but it's starting to drop off a little bit (laughs) uh, Uh, yeah where did you go uh, i went to busan um how'd you get there? there Um, I did not take a train. It was cheaper to fly Whoa. and quicker. It was it was about an hour and fifty bucks round trip to fly to Busan. It would have been wow, what like forty three dollars for a one way ticket and take about three hours on the train. So that's I, cheap oh, as hell. You're a monster. Yeah. Yeah, so I flew, and since it's like an inner, or I mean, it's a domestic flight or whatever, it was a different airport, so it was like quick, baby. It was like in and out. I remember so. airplanes. <laughs> I remember yeah. the sequel to Train to Busan called Plane to Busan, starring Soju Stains. Plain dude, <laughs> if, he very to hit me up, <laughs> if he wants to do Plane to Busan, <laughs> Plane I am to Busan. Willing- <laughs> Fuck Peninsula. Just just garbage That's can right. that whole thing. Yeah. It's, it's rubbish. It's fu- yeah. It's funny that like train to Busan, it's like... Um, Busan's on like, a plane. So infamous, but they don't even go to Busan. They're not even in Busan at all. Now, in this movie, Thirst, they do mention like, oh, you grew up in Busan? Oh, yeah, yeah I noticed I'm that. Busan. Mm-hmm. I was like, oh, hey. Um, it's a coastal town, so it's a lot of more like beaches and um, like cliffs and good views and stuff like that. It was fun. Um, oh, it's a good time. But yeah, not a lot of watching though. Not a lot of watching time. That's it. Sweet Bob. Yo, Bob, you watched been watching. I watched a couple of movies this week. Um, I want to first mention, I watched Amityville Horror 4, 
The Evil Escapes from 1989. Wow. Yes. Wow. A bit of a deep dive. It, this was a uh, made-for-TV movie. <laughs> a bit. I was going to say, that's yeah. not even like a wide... That wasn't a wide release or anything, right? Mm. No, it was not. <laughs> so imagine the Amityville horror, um, but not, okay, set, imagine. not set in the Amityville house. <laughs> so, ah! so what the point is, I'm not sure. Um, is it Amityville Town Hall or something? No, what happens <laughs> What happens is um, uh, the movie starts off at the normal house, the Amityville house with the, you know, the windows that look like eyes and everything. Um, but everybody that lived there has been murdered, you know, so they uh-huh, have uh-huh. they have an estate sale and these people come in and they're buying up all the shit in the house. In the opening scene, you see this like uh, this big lamp that looks sort of like a person. It's got like a, a big giant bulb at the top. That's like a head and it's got sort of like two arms that are hanging out with like two smaller bulbs and either one that look kind of like hands and it's about like, you know, five, six feet tall. It's just like the shape of a person. Uh, it's plugged into the wall and you see this like little ball like come out of the wall and like go through the cord that is connected to the lamp. And then, oh, yeah. and then this like face around here, that means big money. This big evil face appears where the, the big ball is like where the, the big lamp is in the center. (laughs) (laughs) This is Rob's rat moment. This is your rat moment, buddy. It's so ridiculous. So the evil in the house is now embodied in this lamp. And then they have this big estate sale. And this old lady comes and buys a lamp, takes it to her house. And now her house is haunted and people are just getting murdered. Oh, it's an Annabelle situation. It's it's a a haunted lamp. (laughs) It's a lamp. It's so ridiculous. Damn! I've, wow, there's oh. been a lot. Of, like, holy shit! There's I've seen a lot of movies with cursed objects, but <laughs> goddamn room lamp, area lamp is not <laughs> high on the list of of menacing objects. Damn, <laughs> it's not great. Um, it's got a couple <laughs> decent kills and some pretty good. Was it worth stuff. the purchase, Bob? Um, I don't know. I've got three more to work through, so we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Three? There's three more Amityville movies. There's a box set, uh, dude. I think there's like twenty. Or like there's Holy so many but fucking Lord. shit. <laughs> Damn. <laughs> That's, That's so answer. I didn't know that. I th- I thought it ended after like four or five. Yeah, it's one of those titles where like uh it you don't have to purchase the name because it's just a real town, I guess. So people just make oh. movies. Uh, on a wow. Okay. Uh, so gotcha. they throw them in a box set together. That doesn't seem. Yeah. Well, there's, yeah. there's a collection of four <laughs> movies that were released all straight to, to TV. And this was, was it 89. So it was like in between the years of like 89 and like 96, I think they made four. Um, and they're all like supposed to be like cursed objects, I guess. So I'm going to work my way through them and see what's up. Jesus Christ. We should okay. make one. We'll make the next one. It'll yeah. be a haunted uh, Amazon Echo. <laughs> totally. Totally. Um, the only Your other timer thing, has been canceled. The only other <laughs> thing that I want to uh, mention is a uh, slasher that I watched recently from 1981. It's called Night School. I mentioned it briefly over on Let's Get Physical Media. Um but uh, it's a freaking great movie. Uh, Blu-ray was put out by Warner Archive, and it's just like uh, about this uh, this night school um, where all these uh, students, they're all females, are just getting uh, butchered by this random killer that's on the loose, and the killer's like wearing this uh, motorcycle helmet and like black leather getup, and it's like a whodunit they're trying to figure out who the killer is. It's just like a very straightforward... Motorcycle helmet. Yeah, it's like a straightforward meat and potatoes slasher movie. Like if you, if you just want to get down to the comfort food of a slasher, <laughs> this is what you're yeah. looking for. Night school. Um, I enjoyed the <laughs> hell out of it. And of course, the whole time they're like pointing at this giant red herring and you're like, there's no way that's the killer. Yeah. And it's not. It's not. Of course. <laughs> uh, Bob, spoiler. Yeah, I'm going to watch it. Huge spoiler. Come on, Bob. Uh, <laughs> I liked it a lot. Recommend it. Night school from 1981. Uh, but that's all I've been watching myself. Actually, I want to uh, ask Randy. Randy, last week, maybe you forgot about you asked me about Dead of Night, which is that uh, oh, yeah. anthology from night. Did you end up watching it or no? No, no. Just uh, okay. like I, I was just busy as shit this week. So I, didn't no, I was a just chance curious because you had. That was, yeah, that was of interest to me, though, because it's like, that's the one that was like from the 50s or something, right? 1945. Yeah. 45. Yeah. So like just the idea of like a horror anthology from that era is pretty appealing. Okay. <laughs> pretty interesting. I was just curious. Yeah. All right. Uh, we're going to talk about horror news. 
No, we're going to skip news this week. Um, All right. However, if you are listening, uh, the last segment we do on the show is Hotline Scream. Uh, we've got a segment where you guys call in, leave us voicemails. We play them on the show. We don't have any voicemails this week, but if you're listening and want to call in, leave us a voicemail to be featured on next week's show. You can hit us up at 904-638-3231. Um, I kind of wanted to pose a question. So we, we have like a Slack channel, uh, which, uh, all of the hosts of the show are in and uh, several listeners are in. Uh, and we started talking today about like, what movies did we walk out of the theater while watching yep. and why did we walk uh, yeah. out? Um, I kind of thought that was an interesting uh, topic of conversation. I wanted to pose that uh, for next week. If there's a movie that you guys were sitting in the theater and you watched and got up and walked out for some reason, what movie was it? Why'd you walk out? Uh, call us at 904-638-3231. And uh, we want to hear your, your walkout stories. What's yours, Bob? Uh, we t- t- save it for the next show. We'll, we'll all get. Oh, in. okay. We'll all get in on it. <laughs> Fine. I, we have nothing but time to fill in this episode. That's, I thought we could. Ah, that's right. Yeah, we, can roll. we can roll. We can roll for days. Bar. We did our job. We could just roll. Yeah. Fuck I know. It, yeah. Fuck it's a social it. hour. I social got my hour. Sam- my Sammies, and I'm ready. In time? Question mark in this I, bitch. I found the crab cakes, and I got my party joints on. <laughs> joints on. Oh, man, <laughs> it's only a matter of time before you have to go to the loo. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I got crabs. Um. Uh, yeah, I don't know. Do you guys have any other questions you wanted to, to pose? Anything on the off the top? No, of the dome? that's a solid What's your one. Favorite Sunday. <laughs> Sunday. S- Sunday. Like a uh, that's fudge, a- hot fudge Sunday. Like yeah, a hot what? fuzz Sunday. Hot fuzz Ooh, Sunday. Give me that extra fuzz. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> hot to be understood. <laughs> So that's going to do it for us this week here at Straight Chilling. We're going to be Wait, back. I thought we had a voicemail. No voicemails? No, no voicemails. voicemails today, buddy. No. Oh, okay. I would, since um, since we don't have the voicemail or whatever, I would like to say if, um, also too, if anybody wants me to cover like a specific top five, people have been get, giving me video game suggestions. This is the reason that I mentioned this. Um, so as far as covering the horror video games, people have been sending me so suggestions and I appreciate them because there's a, some I just haven't heard of. Um, and Anybody I'm suggested gonna, Katamari Damacy yet? Not yet. <laughs> it's a horror. It's a horrifying game. Um, maybe. Um, I do like that game though. But somebody was telling me about one today that I'm going to check out. Um, but it also in the same vein, if you want a top five horror like suggestion, if you want me to cover something specific, feel free to hit me up. I don't have anything set in stone. I do. I am working on the one for next month. But um, following that, um, if you have any suggestions, suggestions reach out in touch, touch juice <laughs> reach out and yes. touch Oof. so juice stains um <laughs> that, that's gonna do it for us this week uh next week we're gonna be back with a brand new review we're gonna be covering another patreon pick uh this one was chosen by jay moore big thanks to jay moore for supporting us over jay on patreon moore? whoa what's and, he got uh, for us he, next week he chose this tasty little nugget from 2007 that is called the orphanage oh i just assumed that was your pick bob I, <laughs> that's why i was like oh wait i thought we were doing the orphanage oh i didn't realize it's patreon <laughs> yep patreon pick all right um, jay moore i was so convinced we had done this movie already like every we i thought about pick, i thought about picking it when we were like deciding what we wanted to pick for ourselves for the first time in years i was like we've done yeah. the orphanage already so i don't think that's like <laughs> No, that's a del- wait that's del toro right produced yeah. by del toro yeah oh, not produced, directed, okay. yeah. it is a spanish yeah. language film and i haven't seen it in a long time but i remember enjoying it so i'm excited to revisit for sure all right yeah let's do it um until next week please rate review and subscribe to us on itunes you can follow us on twitter at str8 underscore chilling on instagram at straight chilling podcast you can send us an email through our website straight chilling podcast.com if you do want to join us on our slack channel uh we have daily conversations about the movie of the week we talk about horror tv shows horror video games music whatever's in the news pop culture whatever else comes up it's a good time uh, just send us a message on one of those social media outlets and i'll send you a link to join the slack channel uh, don't forget to join us this Friday for our live watch with Joe Bob Briggs. It's always a good time. And uh, until next week, as always, all your mother truckers, keep stroking and uh, keep chilling as well. <laughs>